Hi, and welcome to Bright Minds from Tickmill. I'm your host, Patrick Munley, and in this series, we're setting out to answer some of the most commonly asked questions around investment and trading through entertaining and insightful conversations with seasoned insiders. In the world of finance, fear is everywhere. A recent CarryWise survey on investment behaviour found that 14% of respondents feared losing money. Over 5% feared trapping their money in in investments, and 11% feared investing generally due to a feeling that it's too complicated. Many people have fear around their personal finances. A recent Capital One survey showed that 77% of Americans are anxious about their financial situation, and this will inevitably hold people back from investing. Fear, along with greed, is a leading force in the trading and investment world, affecting both our personal investments and the market at large. On a personal level, Fear can make us act in ways that are not conducive to success in the markets. From skittishly abandoning our long-term strategies to to missing out on amazing opportunities due to excessive anxiety. Changing our relationship to fear can help us overcome these worries and evaluate the markets and our place within them more accurately, leading to better decisions and therefore improved performance. Today, we're joined by Tony Blau. Tony has been on the forefront of martial arts and self-defense education for over 40 years. He founded Blauer Tactical Systems in 1985 to focus on performance psychology and tactical training. And his SPEAR system, which focuses on psychology, physics and physiology, is used by law enforcement organizations globally. Tony now runs fear management seminars, which aim to change our relationship with fear in order to rethink and improve many aspects of our lives, both professionally and personally. In this episode, we'll be discussing fear, how it changes our actions and decisions, and how we can manage those effects. We'll be finding out what happens in our minds and bodies when fear takes hold, and how we can control and harness fear to our advantage when trading and investing. Tony, welcome to Bright Minds. Could you start by telling us a little bit more about you and your career so far, your personal experience with fear, and what made you want to study it? Hey, Patrick, thanks. Uh, great to be here finally. Uh, you know, what an interesting what an interesting opportunity to speak to your audience because it's so counterintuitive, right? You hear uh, Tony's done stuff, law enforcement, military, martial arts. You know, I've worked with uh, pro fighters, amateur fighters, but the, the single most important area we focus on, which I think is the most neglected for all of us, is understanding how to manage fear. And we have an expression in our system, the people who manage their fear manage to fight. To fight being the operative word, you know, it doesn't guarantee victory, but it guarantees you're in the fight and that way you can perform, you know. So, you know, my history, to go back to your question, I've been afraid my entire life. I'm 62 years old right now. I'm still afraid of shit, right? I've got three kids. You know, uh, my daughter's out on a trip. Somebody, my other daughter borrowed my car. My son's flying to Paris. I'm going, okay, is everything okay? Is it like, it, it's just nonstop. And it was weird, you know, from zero to 10 years old, from 10 to 20, from 20 to 30, looking back as we've developed our program. And for those of you watching, I've, I've got um, a, a t-shirt on that says no fear, but it's spelled unconventionally or counterintuitively. Uh, it's spelled K-N-O-W. And the idea was, and it, 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 I wish I'd, I'd learned this lesson when I was a kid, because my life would have been different, is that when we get to know fear, when we want to know fear, when we decide to know fear, we can turn fear into fuel. And a fear now becomes more of a, uh, a, a kind of a stimulus to take action, then we can actually use it in a positive way. Because most of us, as as evidenced by the very detailed introduction, have a negative relationship with it. And uh, if, if, I, if I think about specific events, like as a kid, I was an all round athlete, but I was never the best athlete because I was always worried about what I make the team, what I let down my dad. I can remember always being afraid, Patrick, of, you know, what's what's the score? Are we going to win? Uh, are people judging me? Are people evaluating me? And I think most people carry that around their whole lives. We do that, you know, as adults, before you go to a meeting, if you're going to a social meeting, you're looking in the mirror, you're fixing your hair, you're deciding, shit, I shouldn't wear this, I should wear this, you know? 
when you create the self-awareness to understand where that is coming from, it's a superpower because now that self-awareness inspires some critical thinking. Yep. And the combination of self-awareness, critical thinking, it actually is like a superpower to situational awareness. Um, and, and, and that has direct application in all our lives, but, but particularly in investing and finance and, and, and so on and so forth. But, um, the, to wrap that, to wrap this up, cause I could talk for the whole show on, on how fear <laughs> I've dragged around fear my whole life. Let's assume that I would still have become the self-defense guy, the fear management guy. And I'd still have this career that brought me to here. Had I learned that fear can be a positive thing, in fact, it's almost always a positive thing, that all that would have changed in my life is I would have worried less. I would have made decisions faster. Like my mission right now is to get parents and, and teachers and, and kids to understand the psychology of fear, not the physiology of fear, and that will change everyone's life. Why do you think it's such a, a motivating... Um, emotion insofar as, I mean, I think I've read previously that when you grow up as a child, if you're in an environment whereby your parents are constantly saying, no, don't do that. That's dangerous. Come, you know, come back from the edge. Don't, don't go too near the water. It, it, is it that it, that gets so ingrained in you from an early age and then without that being corrected or you having the self-awareness or someone giving you the the input that, you know, that's not the way to face the world, that that just sticks with you and progresses throughout your life. And a bit like you say, eventually becomes something that's almost debilitating. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Obviously there are, there are certain, they believe there are certain fears that are like DNA level, like a fear right. of snakes, spiders, uh, falling. So we know to, to walk to the edge of a cliff, like going, Ooh, that looks like a big drop there. We know that, you're in the woods and you hear what looks like a rattlesnake. You don't look to your buddy and go, Hey, is that a small tambourine band? Or does that sound like, <laughs> like, 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 you know, like your body just knows. But other than that, there's a theory out there that almost all other fears are learned or taught through uh, uh, society or your, your guardians, your parents, your mentors. So there's quite a, uh, quite a famous um, trading psychology uh, guy, not with us anymore, Mark Douglas. One of the analogies he gave um, in one of his early books was about uh, a, a child and a parent meeting a dog. So the parent had grown up in a situation whereby every dog was deemed to be, a, you know, a hound of the Baskerville was going to slaughter you where you stood. Um, and he taught then about the child who meets the dog without the parents around him. So without any influence from the parent, the child will meet the dog and the natural instinct is to want to embrace the dog. Whereas that same child with the parent who's overtly protective or had had a bad experience in their childhood with dogs, immediately the hand goes on the arm and they're pulled back. And, it's, and it shows how just that one simple act can craft your response and almost like a fear response to an animal that you know may or may not be a, a threat it just really drives home that idea of how, like you say, mentors or your care, your primary caregivers are really shape that early phase of your response to potentially threatening situations, not necessarily threatening situations. Yeah, a hundred percent. And there's an interesting and more subtle aspect to fear. We could argue that there are no bad fears because if there's true danger, yeah. that fear spike is like an alarm sounding in our body. If it's imagined danger, and I wrote an article on this uh, recently, that the the difference between a, a, a real threat and a perceived threat is only the threat, but the impact on the body and the mind is the same. It, you know, it's interesting because there's the that classic belief system of like, you know, money is the root of all evil, right? Sure. But nobody in finance and investment believes that because they wouldn't be in that business. Sure. It, 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 you know, and so someone introduces you to somebody in a business and you're, and you're going to like pitch them this idea of, Hey, let me represent you. Let me invest your money. If that person grew up with the mom that was afraid of the dogs, but the dog was money. Yeah. They might look at you and nod and then they're not returning your calls. Right. And it's just, yeah. it's an imagined fear, but the result in terms of behavior is exactly the same. So there's, there's a story I tell 
uh, in our No Fear seminar of uh, growing, be- in, growing up in Canada, you're either a, a skier or a skater, right. uh, you know, and, and my family grew up on skis. My parents were both very famous in the ski patrol. And I, right. was, I was skiing when I was three years old and I was really, really good, but I never won a race. I would always wipe out. So people would say, like some people go, oh, you're a self-sabotager. I go, well, no, I always showed up on time. I skied my ass off, but I would always catch a tip. I would always wipe out. And I realized that my ski coach wasn't a ski coach, Patrick. He was a ski trainer. And I think this is application for all the parents listening, but also the managers and leaders yeah. is is sometimes you think you're mentoring people, but really what you're doing is just teaching them steps and stages, and then you can't figure out why they're not rising to the occasion. Sure. The rise to the occasion element is a more of an emotional, psychological flow state where, where that individual is unconsciously or consciously using their fear of an outcome to drive them towards the outcome, if that makes sense. To- yeah, I totally agree with that. Totally agree with that. that and that brings me to uh, the, the next point I wanted to, to speak with you about. I know we talked about it off camera before, about the, the victim's vocabulary and how that mm-hmm. can really negatively impact performance and, you know, that like self-talk loop that starts going and, you know, takes you down a, a pretty dark path, really. Yeah, so I always make this joke uh, that, let's say you're having like a really good day and then tomorrow's a really good day. We start to think like, man, like, okay, what's, what's, what's up? What's going to happen? Because this is like, everything I'm doing is touching the goal. We start to almost start thinking something's going to happen. Like when I get a big opportunity in business, I, it's an unsolicited thought that goes, oh man, okay, how's this deal going to go South? What's going to happen yeah. here? Yeah. Cause, cause as entrepreneurs, we work on way more deals that never happen than deals that do happen. That is such a great um, link to investing and trading because more often than not, you're getting negative feedback from the markets or the investments you're involved in, whereby they're either not performing as you'd anticipated or they're stagnating. But then it's just that small percentage that work out and pay out. And as long as you can manage your internal state to go with the flow and let, you know, let the good opportunities run and be uh, don't have fear about cutting the bad opportunities then that right. that that balance of probabilities ultimately works in your favor in the end so so an interesting thing and i come back to this this article i wrote i wrote recently about the difference between real fear and imagined fear it, they they both can debilitate they both can create what we call emotional inertia inertia so inertia is like a, like a body yep. in space inability to move emotional inertia is I should be selling, but I'm hesitating, or I should be buying, but I'm hesitating. Yeah. Um, the difference between the imagined fear and the real fear doesn't change our physiology and our psychology. Yeah. But we only find out afterwards that it was imagined fear. But the yeah. impact and the toll on our body. So a really interesting concept and, and one that that we teach people to work through is if you could. If you could vet, in other words, you could evaluate and go, oh my God, this is imagined fear, then you can get out of the fear loop faster. In terms of business and life, we imagine more fears than we experience. If I talk to somebody and I go, hey, why don't you invest? Oh, I don't invest. Why? Money's the root of all evil. Okay. If you look at any belief system and you peel that onion, the core of a belief, especially an erroneous one, is going to be fear. Why somebody does or doesn't do something is is going to be fear. And and I've been on negotiation podcasts. I've been on military podcasts. I've been on mental health podcasts. And it always comes, how is it that I can talk about the idea of improving your self-awareness so that you understand what you're afraid of so that you can decide, is this a reasonable fear or what am I going to do with this information? How does that have ubiquitous application and and it does because and i alluded to this earlier when we get a fear spike a fear spike is 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 a external stimuli or an internal stimuli if i imagine it yeah. it's in my mind if it's external i see it then my mind starts to go right away yeah when i go in the fear loop what immediately starts to happen is without and, and this is universal regardless of gender age experience doubt 
hesitation, procrastination. Those yeah. three steps happen automatically and they can happen like in a nanosecond. Yeah. And I'll give you, I'll give everyone listening to this uh, uh, an example. We've all forgotten our keys, our wallet, or our phone somewhere at a restaurant, at a meeting, in a bathroom. And as soon as you walk, there's a part of your RAS, your reticular activating system that goes, my watch, my phone, my wallet, whatever it is. Have you ever, you, you traveled, you've traveled obviously, yep, yep. you know, in your life. Have you ever walked out of your hotel room and as the door is closing and you're two steps away, you realize you forgot your key in the room? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but what happens? This happens. I'm going to act it out for people watching the show. You're like this, you're walking and all of a sudden you put your hand in your pocket and then all of a sudden in slow motion, you're like, no. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you try to lunge back with your foot, with your hand. Now here's what's so insane about this. You're, you're in a hotel and there's, there's 10,000 keys down the front desk. You know that if your wallet was in the room, security will come up with you. If you got your wallet on you, you give your key. But we still dramatically go, no. Uh, and, we, and we, but here's the funny thing. It doesn't matter if that was about uh, some uh, war, about some election, and you know immediately that's going to impact the stock market. And, yep. and now there's going to be real news and fake news. And you got to decipher all that. And your 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 clients are panicking. That's like closing the door closing with the key where you go, no, and you react. <laughs> but what I want to explain to everybody here, in that single moment where a stimulus was introduced too quickly, our brain goes to doubt, hesitation, procrastination. And then there's an immediate overreaction. But if you learn the system and you study it, you can go, wait a minute. You can woosa for a second and go, okay, wait a minute. This is okay. This is cool. I'll get my key downstairs. I've got my wallet on me. And you start to analyze, okay, what should be the next intelligent step? Specifically for our audience, Tony, I mean, that is, is brilliant. I mean, it's something I was taught a, a long time ago is the difference between reaction and response. So mm -hmm. the reaction is all emotion and adrenaline, but response comes from logic. Choosing, and thinking. Yeah, 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 exactly. And is there a mechanism that you can internalize that means you, you can, one, recognize reaction, and then two, move to response very quickly? So the idea is, is can we use external and internal fear and see it like a hologram map that we're standing on or living through. And what I mean by that is I'm driving along and um, all of a sudden a stimulus gets introduced too quickly. I'm like, this is perfect. I'm going to, I'm going to get to the airport. We're going to get there. I got one hour to get to the meeting. This is perfect. And you get onto the road and all of a sudden there's like a traffic jam. Yeah. And immediately you feel your nervous system go, oh shit. Right. Yeah. I mean, this happens and this has happened to you. It's happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Look, I'm gonna, and this is what I mean by an external stimulus triggers a movie in your mind. Unless you go, OK, what is the map? The map is this. Doubt creates hesitation. Hesitation creates procrastination. Unchecked. What do I mean by unchecked? Meaning I don't have a system to reflect and then dissect. Yeah. And that was the reaction versus response moment. Yeah. Yeah. And so we've we've heard of um, the react in, and this is from this was actually inspired from some military training with with a unit I was working with years ago. We would talk. Everyone was always reacting to contact, and we said, "Look, we need to preact to contact." Right. Preacting is you've done good scenarios, you've learned the system, you understand what the emotional psychological system is going to do. Yeah. So if I know what my mind's going to do, like for example. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, you know what? I want to practice my resilience today. <laughs> I, hope, I hope something catastrophic happens. Let's, let's hope for a crash today just to practice resilience and keep your, like nobody thinks that way. In other words, we don't get intentional reps on how do we handle stress and duress. Yeah. And so part of the No Fear program is actually, uh, uh, we have, we have a, a graphic that, that think of it as almost like a script map for the mind yeah. where we're talking about the, I, I, I call it, uh, the neural circuitry of fear, how we make decisions under duress. And it starts with this idea that if self-awareness is the Holy grail of superpowers, yeah, right? So if I come into your office and you're sitting there like this, 
you know, doing this sort of thing, nervous twitching. And I go, dude, what's happening? And you go, like, how many times have you said to somebody who you know they're being bothered by something? It could be yeah. personal health, finance, yeah. relationship. And you go, hey, man, are you okay? And they look at you and they go, yeah, why? What's up? <laughs> and, and their lack of self-awareness, and this is so important to everyone listening, lack of self-awareness of being in the fear loop consumes time. That time in the fear loop is time you can't be- get back. And time is the only uh, resource we can't regenerate. I, l- I love the acronym. I'm sure you've heard it before. Fear, false expectations appearing real. Yeah. And, and, and I have a fun definition of it. It's when I'm visualizing something in the future that is debilitating me in the present, slowing down. And, and listen, business loves speed. Yeah. Right, and a lot of the stuff that you guys do in finance, there's no second yeah. place. No, no, like it's oh, I came in second. Like no, 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 second doesn't count anymore. This is <laughs> this deal's over. So, so business loves speed, and the only way we can compete is if we improve our self awareness. Our self awareness lets us know, dude, you're in the fear loop. When you're in the fear loop, you're consuming time. If I can manage the fear, I can help manage time, and that's. Like, I don't even know what that's worth to people is the ability to manage time. For our specific audience, the the things you've mentioned there, Tony, I think are absolute pearls because for a lot of people starting out in trading and investing, this fear loop actually liquidates accounts. You know, people lose their, sometimes it can be their life savings because of being trapped in this fear loop and not being able to have the level of self-awareness to respond in a timely fashion to and and i mean there are lots of things within the markets that are outside of your control but cutting a loser or letting a winning position run is within your control and that is a response um whereas the the, like you say the fear loop is creating that emotional reaction where you make missteps and mistakes that that is a quite a common uh quite a common theme within certainly within the retail investing community so i think for um, this audience to really grasp what you're saying there and take that on board is uh, is is gold dust. The application of everything we've talked about during today's session, I think, will just be priceless for them. Um, so, really want to thank you for your your time today, Tony. And most importantly, is there anywhere that our listeners can go to to follow up on some of these concepts? I think you mentioned to me offline that you've got a quite a neat PDF that they people can download. Yeah, like ho- hopefully you'll share that with 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 anyone listening. It's called Making Friends with Fear. And if anyone wants to talk, I I, I handle all my social media. If you got a, a question, like people are always trying to get me to outsource it, but I love communicating and talking to people. And if you've got a question or something that I can I can do just just hit me up and uh, and and we'll get we'll talk. Tony, thank you so much again for your time today, and thanks everyone for listening to Bright Minds from Tickmill. If you found these conversations useful, you can find us at YouTube.com/slash at Tickmill Global. Let us know any questions or comments below the video, or get in touch directly at podcast at Tickmill.com. While through these conversations, we offer tips and insider knowledge, nothing on the podcast should be considered financial advice. And we encourage listeners to seek professional financial advice whenever they can. Guests' opinions are their own and not necessarily reflecting the views of Tickmill Global. Once again, thank you, Tony Blau, for your time and thanks everyone for listening. 